going to begin by reading the first three verses in Psalms 19. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. You ever been asked any difficult questions about Christianity? I know I, I sure have. I, I thought about three right off the bat. The first one is, how can Christianity be the only way to heaven? Have you ever been asked that? A lot of people wonder that. And, and you may say, well, how do we get that anyway? Well, it's pretty simple. John 14, 6, Jesus said it. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Notice He didn't say, I am a way. I am the way. And then He went on to say, no one comes to the Father except through Me. Now, we're Christians because we're followers of Christ. We follow Christ because He's the only way to the Father. So when someone asks you, why do you believe that? Why is Christianity the only way? then you can simply take them to John 14, 6 and says, because Jesus says it's the only way and my faith is in Him. What about this question? How can Christ be known in spiritually dark places? Anybody ever ask you that or you ever think about that? What happens to a person that lives in a closed country like I think about uh, North Korea, for example? Maybe they've never seen a Bible. Maybe they've never heard the gospel. Maybe they've never been introduced to Christ or, or been told about Jesus and how He died on the cross for them. They're in a closed country. It's not allowed. What about that person? Will they go to hell? What about this question? Is sin still wrong if God's law is not present? For example, that closed country. Someone's never read God's Word, never looked at a Bible, doesn't know God's law, doesn't know His law to keep. So is it still wrong? Well, the short answer is yes, but we're going to see why in a few minutes as we study this passage. If a person is committing sins and they've never heard the Ten Commandments or never been introduced to the laws of God, they're still going to be held accountable before God. These are hard questions. However, the answers to all of them is in God's Word. And a lot of it's right here in Psalms 19. And so the first thing I want to show you in Psalms 19 is God's reality is evident. As we just read in the first three verses. Now, listen to this. I'm going to read from Romans. I'm reading Romans 1. 18 through 20, here's what it says. And basically listen for this because what Paul is telling us is that God reveals His truth to everyone. Closed country, open country, no matter where, God reveals His truth. In Romans 1, 18 through 10, 20, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I think that's interesting right there because some people say, well, how can they possibly know that it's wrong? Oh, they know it's wrong, but they suppress it with their sin. They don't want to admit that it's wrong. It's not does, does a person know that what's right and wrong. It's that do they want to do right or not is really the question. Verse 19 says, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. In them. God puts the truth in them. For God has shown it to them. God Himself shows every man, woman, boy, and girl that He creates. He puts His laws in their heart. Verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen. Some people say, well, you can't even see God. How do you know there's a God? Because His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. Listen to this. So they are without excuse. That's how much God is able to reach anyone and everyone with the truth of the Gospel. So much so that they can't deny it. And when they stand before Him on Judgment Day, they'll be without excuse if they don't receive it. But looking at these first three verses here, look at what we see here. Just talking, it's just beginning to talk about the heavens and how the heavens speak of God. In other words, just by looking up at the night sky, just by looking at the sun in the daytime, 
They speak of a, of a holy God, a magnificent creator. Look at it in, in verse 1. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. That's praise. Declares the glory of God. In the end of verse 1, it says, and the firmament shows his handiwork. That's proof. And then in verse 2, at the beginning, it says, day unto day, utter speech. That's preaching. And to be it, and night unto night reveals knowledge. That's teaching. And then in verse 3 it says, There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That's testimony. I mean, the heavens speak of God. Just by looking at, if you can see the heavens, you have to know there's a God. God's reality is evident. Just going back to that Romans passage one more time. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Listen, if God introduces Himself, there's no excuse. And He certainly has the power to do that. And He's teaching us right here in Psalms 19 how He does it. And then we see not only is God's reality evident, but God's reality is everywhere. When we look at verses 4 through 6, you're going to see there's no place too distant and there's no person unreachable. God's reality is throughout all the earth. In verse 4 it says their line. Now, I don't know how it interprets in yours, but that word can be interpreted sound or voice. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. No matter where one dwells throughout all the earth, the reality of God is there. It said through all the earth and to the end of the world. Consider what Paul preached to the philosophers of Athens on Mars Hill. Acts 17, 26 and 27, here's what he told them. In this story, he comes upon a monument and it says to the unknown God. And he says, oh, I know who that, let me tell you who the unknown God is. And here's what he says to him. He says that he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from any one of us. Now what I find interesting there is that part that says that God's determined our pre-appointed times and the boundaries of our dwellings. In other words, He determined that you would be here on this earth in the 21st century. He determined that you would be here in Riverdale, Georgia, or wherever you may live. And, and He predetermined that before you was ever born. He knows before we're born all that's going to be going on in our life. He predetermines that. You say, preacher, why is that important? Because if He cares that much about you, He's certainly going to show you how to find Him. And then it went on to say there that He's not far from any one of us. Doesn't matter where you're at on this earth, you can find the Lord if you're looking for Him. I think about the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, and I want you to turn to Acts chapter 8. Keep your finger in Psalms 19, we'll come back. But turn to Acts chapter 8. I want to read you an interesting story that, that exemplifies this point. It's the Ethiopian eunuch, he was a diplomat with great authority. He was a diplomat of Candace the Queen of the Ethiopians. And we see him in this story. And I'm going to start reading verse 26 of Acts chapter 8. It says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. So the first point I want you to see, he was coming to Jerusalem to worship, all right? And then it says he was returning and sitting in the chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. He, he was returning back to Ethiopia. He's sitting in the chariot, taking a break, and he's reading a scroll, the prophet Isaiah. And so Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? 
And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in Scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of whom does the prophet say this of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the scripture preaching Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. So that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. Now here was a man that it said he went to Jerusalem to worship. But clearly he didn't know what he was going to worship. And here he is coming back reading a scroll, but clearly he didn't understand what the scroll was teaching. He didn't know who Jesus was. But what was he doing? He was searching for him. He was earnestly searching for truth. And, and listen, if anybody is searching for truth, God's going to reveal truth to them. And he sends Philip to reveal truth to him. Now, you know what's important about that? God reveals truth just by looking up in the heaven. But I notice in His Word that whenever someone's truly looking, that He always sends somebody to them. See, we're the sin. We're the ones that are called to go out and reach other people and tell them about Jesus. They may be searching. They may be wondering. They, they know there's a God, but they don't understand who He is. And you may be the one that gets to explain it to them. And Philip got to explain to him. And what happens? He accepts Jesus Christ. He says, I believe He's my Savior. And he baptizes Him right there. And it says He goes on His way rejoicing. Why? Because the search was over. The search was over. Now he knew who God was. Now he knew who His Savior was. I also think this is a side note chasing a little rabbit. But I think it's interesting there that Philip and the eunuch went down into the water to be baptized. And it said they come up out of the water. See, this is believer's baptism. This is how Jesus was baptized. He went down into the water. He come up out of the water. You say, preacher, why do you bring that up? Because I want everybody to have their baptism in the right place. You, a believer's baptism is after you become a believer. Philip became a believer and then he was baptized as the first act of obedience. Now, I understand that some churches will sprinkle up. I'm not uh, disparaging that today. What I'm doing is I'm showing you what true baptism is. And it's baptism by immersion. And we're following Jesus and we're giving a testimony, a public testimony of our faith by being baptized in the water. And so there, I chased that rabbit. But I want people to understand what true baptism is all about. Believers' baptism it's what we all need to follow. If, you, if you've not got that right, just let me know. Hey, Pastor, I believe Jesus is the Christ. I believe He's my Savior. But I've never been baptized. We need to get that done. Yeah. We need to Amen. get it done. Alright, so here we see that this Ethiopian eunuch, this diplomat in the desert, was seeking earnestly for God and God made a way for him to find Him. In the desert. Away from everybody. Now, there's another little story, and this won't be quite as long, but it, does, it tells, shows us the same thing. Just flip over to chapter 10. In chapter 10, look at the first four verses there. This is the story of Cornelius. And we see it says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. A devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Now get that. Here's a man. It says a devout man. He feared God. He gave alms. He gave offerings. He, he did all these things right, but he didn't know who God was. But he was sincerely trying to live for Him. Why? Because the law was written on his heart. 
He knew what was right and wrong and he's trying to live for him. And, and then it says in verse 3, it says about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Isn't that something? Here's a man who doesn't know who Jesus Christ is, doesn't know the true way of salvation, but he was seeking God. He was seeking truth. And it said that he was seeking so earnestly, this angel said this to him. He says, your prayers, your mountain of prayers have come before God, and he's sending me to you now. And as you continue to read that story, when you get home tonight, you'll see that Peter was sent to him to express to him the truth of the gospel and his entire household was saved and they were all baptized. Listen, if, if someone is truly seeking truth, if someone is truly seeking God, they're going to find Him because He's not far from any one of us. So God's Reality is evident. God's reality is everywhere. There's no escaping it. And next, I would say that God's reality uh, is throughout the heavens. Psalms 19, 4 through 6 says this. It says, in them, and talking about the heavens, because remember the first three verses, he's talking about looking into the heavens. It says, in them, the heavens, he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and the circuit to the other end. And there's nothing hidden from the heat. Now, he's given us an example here of how vast God's domain is. And he uses the example of the sun. And it says the sun is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, which, by the way, one of the names we know Christ is, is the bridegroom says the sun is a bridegroom coming out of the chambers and it's like a strong man running a race. But here's what I want you to get. It's rising. It's from one end of heaven and it's circuit to the other end of heaven. There's nothing hidden from its heat. In other words, that's how vast God is. That's how vast God is. For You know, for many years, critics had scoffed at these verses. They were claiming that they taught an old-fashioned doctrine of geocentricity. It's a belief that the sun revolved around the earth. Well, clearly we know that's, no, that's not true now with the science that we have. For ages, scientists just thought the sun was stationary. But in more recent times, they discovered that the sun, in fact, moves in the heavens and it has a circuit. It moves through the heaven at approximately 600,000 miles per hour. And it says that it travels through the heaven. It has a circuit, just like the Bible said right there. And its circuit is so large, scientists say, that it would take approximately 200 million years to reach one into the other. That's what scientists believe. But here's what I'm pointing to you. It says how fast God is. That's how wide God is. That's how great God is. Now you think about that. It symbolizes just how far-reaching God's love is. There's, there's nowhere to hide. You, you think about the sun. You go out there today, no matter where you're at, you see the evidence of the sun. You feel the heat of the sun. You can even be in the shade, but you still see the sun. There's nowhere you can go and hide. When you're outside, you can't hide from the sun. And you can't hide from God. There's no place too distant that you can run. There's no place too dark that you can hide. One of the Psalms says that, that uh, in midnight, it's as if it's noonday to you, O oh God. God sees us. He knows us. He loves us. We, we run from Him. We, sometimes we, we're living in such a way that, it, that we want to hide from God, but there's no hiding from God. He, he knows where we are. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You search for me with all your heart, guess what's going to happen? You're going to find me. That Ethiopian eunuch, he didn't know a single believer, but he is searching with all his heart. He found Jesus. Cornelius didn't know a single believer, 
but he searched with all his heart and Jesus made a way for him to come to know who Christ was. God's reality is throughout the heaven. One other thing here, God's reality is throughout his people. Because for the eunuch, for Cornelius, both of them, God sent one of his people to go and share the gospel with them. We should be sharing the gospel with people that we know, with people that we love, with people that we live, live next door to, with people that we work with. We should be that voice of reason for the Lord that, that when someone is seeking Him, and I can think so many times just flashing through my mind right now of people that God put them in my path or put me in their path, and they were at that exact moment before they were searching God. And all we got to do is look for it. We just got to be looking for it. Listen to this quote from Chuck Swindoll. It says, God has placed you where He has placed no one else. No one else in the world has the same relationships you have. No one will stand in the same grocery store line at exactly the same moment you do. No one else will come across a hungry diplomat in the desert at exactly the same time that you do. God hasn't put you in those places merely to model truth. Listen, the voice of the Spirit to whisper in your ear and watch for the stranger on the road and be aware of your, your opportunities to go where He would send you. Watch. Be aware. Look for that person that might be the one searching that God's having you cross their path. God's reality is everywhere. Acts 17, 27 says, He is not far from each one of us. He's close. We just got to seek Him. And also, God's reality is righteous. As we continue in Psalms, looking at verses 7 through 11, here's why this is important. Because no one would be able to stand before God on Judgment Day and point their finger at Him and say, God, you're not fair. You had me... Uh, you had me born in North Korea, and I never saw a Bible. God, you're not fair. You had me born on some excluded island that the gospel never reached. God, you're not fair. No one will be able to claim that when they stand before God on Judgment Day. Why will sinners go to hell? You ever think about that? Why? No one's going to go to hell because they haven't heard the gospel I know that surprises you, right? Sinners will go to hell for coveting, for lusting, for lying, for stealing, for killing, for disobedience. That's why sinners will go to hell. Nobody is going to be sent to hell. Sin's not a failure to hear the gospel. Sin is violating God's law. That's what sin is, and there's a punishment for that. And if God has already revealed to us from the beginning of time who He is, then we're without excuse. And if we choose to live a life of sin, we're going to face the punishment for that life of sin. Now look at Psalms 19, verses 12 and 13. It says, Who can understand His errors? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. The psalmist here knew that he was a sinner. It, the laws were written on his heart. He knew it. He, he talked about his errors. He talked about his secret faults. You got any of those? He talked about his presumptuous sins. In other words, yeah, I know it's a sin, but I deserve it. I, I should have a right to live this way if I want to. He talked about great transgressions. Listen, he knew that sin was a violation of God's law and he is crying out for God to forgive it. He says, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. And let's face this, folks, it's a battle. It's a battle every day, a battle between righteousness and sinfulness. And we're fighting it every day. We need to be prayerful like the psalmist here. And then we see that Christ is the one that rescues us from the consequences of sin. Why do men go to hell, men, women, boys, and girls? Because they've committed sin. They violated God's law. Think about it this way. 
If a person jumps out of a plane without a parachute, they fall to the earth and die, right? Why did they die? You, would, you could say because they didn't have on a parachute, but the truth is they died because they broke the law of gravity. They died because of the law, not because of not putting on the parachute. Now, if they would have put on the parachute, would they have lived? Sure, they would have lived. He had a parachute that could have rescued him, and we have a parachute that can rescue us, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ can rescue us. Listen, if a sinner refuses to trust Jesus Christ, when they leave this life and they enter into eternity, the, the eternity for them is going to be hell. It's clear. God's Word is going to be hell. This is because they violated God's law and they now face the consequences of their sins. They've earned that. Had they put their trust in Jesus Christ, I like the way Romans 13, 14 puts it. It says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like put on that parachute. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be saved. Sin is a violation of God's law. Salvation is Christ's rescue. And so I'd ask you this. Have you ever believed in Jesus Christ? Have you ever made that uh, profession of faith? Have you ever prayed that prayer that says, you know what, Jesus, I want to put you on. We come to the time of response. And I want to ask you this. Looking at that last verse in chapter 19, as you're thinking about your response today, that last verse says this, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. And so my question to you is this, based on that verse. Is your heart acceptable to God? Where's your heart today? Listen, we know that the reality of God is true. We've read this morning in God's Word how there's no escaping the reality of God. We've read this morning that it's God from heaven that introduces us to Him. And then if we realize that and we begin to seek Him, He's going to create a way for us to come to Him and to know Him in truth. To know that Jesus Christ died for your sins and my sins on the cross. And maybe you've been going through this life and you've been thinking, yeah, I believe in God. That was Cornelius. Yeah, I believe there's a God. That was the Ethiopian eunuch. And and they were believing that they didn't know enough to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, if you've been going through life up until today saying, yes, I'm a good person. Yes, I believe in God. And for the first time, you realize that there's more to it than that. For the first time, you realize that there's one more step you have to make, and that's to believe on the name of Christ. To believe that He took your place on the cross. He took your sins and nailed it to His cross. He died in your place. He paid the punishment for your sins so that you could go free. Now, if you've never prayed a prayer receiving that gift, and it's a gift. God's not going to force you to take it. A gift is not a gift unless you just receive it. If you've never received that gift of eternal life through accepting Christ as your Savior, today's the day.